Support for Conversations with Elle McFarland was provided by Old National Bank Comcast Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance and North American Banking Company I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. My guests today are Catherine Penker. She's library director for St. Paul Public Library and Beth Burns. Beth is president of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, two separate but kindred organizations. I thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And so before the show, I raise mm -hmm. the question. Uh, it's amazing that technology now means that perhaps in my, uh, I'll call it a PDA so people can laugh, or my smart, <laughs> or smartphone, uh, perhaps in my smart smartphone right now, I have access to uh, almost every library in the world. True or false? I'm going to let you do that. Yes. <laughs> yes, both. Um, certainly our phones give us access to so much information and libraries are very much about information um, and at the same time I think there are really important reasons to still go to a library mm -hmm. in your neighborhood. Okay, so let's talk about that experience of going to a library and I'll start by sort of my um, a statement or story about how much it meant to me. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents insisted that I go to the library and mm -hmm. I go on my bicycle to a library in Kansas City and I'd get lost uh, in a book or in books mm -hmm. or in stacks and I'd be there for hours mm -hmm. and hours mm -hmm. and always leave with an armful of books and be so happy yeah. and proud of myself for reading so much and going mm -hmm. back again. So the library experience meant a pathway, a gateway mm -hmm. to the world. And so I'm sure that's still the case, probably even more now than it ever was before. What do you think? Yes, absolutely. That we know the books and the materials at libraries can take you anywhere in the world. Um, I also think what's fun about libraries today here in St. Paul is that the people in the library are also from mm -hmm. all over the world. And so we know St. Paul is really a global city. We have people from all over the world who now call St. Paul home, mm -hmm. and they're all at the library. Everyone uses the library. And so I, libraries are about books. Libraries are also about people. Mm -hmm. Besides books, mm -hmm. film? Oh, film, yes. Movies, music, you can check out vinyl if you listen mm -hmm. to vinyl records, mm -hmm. um, but also classes and programs and events and experiences. And I had someone say to me uh, last year, you know, I can, I like to buy my books. This person said I like to own them, mm -hmm. but I will go to a library for an experience, an arts experience, a cultural experience. I can't order that to my front door, and I value that and I appreciate that. So what roles do friends play in supporting uh, this idea of the value of libraries? Well, I think as I was listening to you talk and the idea of libraries are people, I was speaking with a woman yesterday and she, I said, oh, thank you so much for supporting the friends. And she said, oh, I love to support the friends because the library is one of my best friends. <laughs> and I think that in a nutshell mm -hmm. is sort of what for 75 years the friends has done in St. Paul. The city in St. Paul does a really great job of understanding the value of the library, um, what the library means in terms of creating a city that works for everyone. But the city budget can't always do everything that the library needs to meet the needs of all of the people who are coming into our city, whether it's kids or older adults. And so the Friends historically has done fundraising to make sure that things that are new, things that haven't been tested, have the time, the space, and the resources mm -hmm. um, to be tried in the library. We also do advocacy so that people remember that the library is still relevant. Sometimes there is maybe a notion that the library isn't as relevant anymore because mm -hmm. you've got your PDA or mm -hmm. your, <laughs> your smartphone that you have so much access to the world. But the library is maybe more relevant now than it has ever been, and it's a privilege as the friends to be charged with sort of carrying that story forward and, and really helping people understand that the library exists for you, mm -hmm. it exists for everyone, and it is at least as, if not more relevant today than ever before. And how do you explain and engage technology? How do you engage and embrace change mm -hmm. uh, in the venues that people have to uh, gain access to information or materials? Uh, how do you plan for that so that you maintain that, that relevance 
and uh, the value mm -hmm. that you bring communities and individuals. What do you do? Well, I think part of what has been important about the Friends work over the last number of years is making sure that the resources are, exist for the library to make technology available mm -hmm. to everyone. Um, technology and digital literacy and access to technology, those are all conversations that we need to be having about creating an equitable city. And we need to remember that not everybody has access to full-on high-speed technology in their pocket or even in their home. Mm -hmm. And there, the library is, that's the library in a nutshell. I mean, you can get on a computer, you can access the internet, you can access everything in the internet, um, but you can do so in a way that is also guided by people who are trained resources. The staff at the library are as wonderful a gift as any book that you'd ever open in terms of just the generosity of time and the knowledge that they can bring, because having access to information doesn't mean the same thing as knowing how to use information. And we are so inundated now with information coming at us from every angle. Um, the library is a really valuable resource in terms of figuring out how to navigate that. Mm -hmm. uh, Catherine, so how do you how do you build that into uh, the deliverable uh, for the library, getting the quality personnel, mm -hmm. the people that have yes. uh, knowledge and passion, mm -hmm. yep. the ability yep. to excite yep. and to guide you in your search for yourself. Yep. How do you do that? Yeah, well, when we, uh, hire, you know, we were talking about this before we came on that um, the library field is a very, very much a values driven field. Mm -hmm. And so people who want to work in a library are often people who want to work in communities, people who really care about learning and they care about making learning available to everyone, no matter where you're coming from and that you can learn whatever you want. That we at the library, uh, we, we can help you connect with your passions, but we're not going to tell you, here's what you need to learn today. Mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about technology, I think, you know, technology is only useful if you know how to use it. Mm -hmm. And so people, staff at the library are often, spend much of their day helping people with, how do I upload a document? How do I set up an email account? Um, I need to print something. Um, I want to learn coding. I want to use a 3D printer, but I don't want to buy a 3D printer at home. Well, you can come to the library. Mm -hmm. And so really, um, again, making sure technology is not only available, but also that people are able to use it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Beth, uh, to support that, um, companies are, and individuals are invited to show support. Uh, we're here in part uh, as uh, uh, a program supported by Comcast of right. Twin Cities. Absolutely. And they're partners with you as well. Yep. How do companies bring their support to the work? I th it's so critical and companies like Comcast are a really good example of where public-private partnership works in tandem to mm -hmm. make things like technology available. I know that Comcast in one of their business lanes has internet essentials which is really designed to help make the internet available at an affordable rate for families at home and then Comcast also looks into the community and looks at libraries and other organizations that are doing work that's also in that space and educating people to use technology as a tool, understand um, the power of technology. And so an investment from a company like Comcast means that we can offer uh, digital literacy classes. We can teach people how to set up those email accounts. We can use the tools of technology in our homework centers. And we can just sort of break down barriers that are key, that technology can create and we can't do that without individual support but also corporate support and so Comcast because they're already in that space really understands the value for that and so we love having them apart as a partner in that regard. And how does the library itself uh, engage uh, organizations like Comcast or like um, other companies uh, and agencies to deliver value? Yeah. Well, Beth I think brought up the key phrase, which is public-private partnership, mm -hmm. and that we are really looking for opportunities um, where values and mutual interests align. And so in this case with Comcast, we both really have a, a shared interest around digital inclusion for everyone in the community. And so we are able to do a lot of work with the public resources that we get from taxpayers. Um, and with the support of a Comcast and companies like them, we can do even more and we can go even further. I'm looking at your webpage now, and uh, the headline, 
is that as of January 1st, 2019, St. Paul Public Library is fined free. Talk yes. about that. That's, yes. a big, yes. that's a big deal. It is a big, big, deal. big deal. Very happy to talk about that. Yes, as of January 1st of this year, we no longer charge late fines on overdue books. Um, and and what happened when you made the announcement and what's been the response <laughs> of people? Are people bringing books back now or, uh, or what? It's, you know, some people are afraid, are you going to break the library? Mm -hmm. I can't imagine a library without late fines. Um, and no, we have not broken the library. <laughs> and we have had so many great stories of people coming back mm -hmm. and a lot of people saying, uh, you know, someone rode an elevator with one of our staff at the Central Library downtown and she said, I have been praying to come back to the library, but my sister checked out books years ago and I had fines and I couldn't come. Now I'm back and I don't know where to start. Can you help me? What wow. can I start with? So um, feeling guilty a little bit and keeping you away because you, know, you, you know. That was one of yeah. our interesting learnings. Part yeah. of where we came to this was uh, we were talking to community members all last year. We were doing a strategic plan and doing mm -hmm. a lot of listening. Um, and we learned that fines themselves are a barrier, but even just the fear of fines, mm -hmm. that people think of libraries and they sometimes think of guilt or shame, mm -hmm. and that's not what we want. Not and so we wanted to break that connection mm -hmm. and say, no, come back, come in, this is your library, mm -hmm. this is all of our library. Um, so we couldn't be more excited. That's great. Uh, I'm always concerned about uh, the uh, preservation or presentation of cultural realities. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm interested in both of your takes on how libraries help people from different ethnic communities uh, both explore and uh, defend, mm -hmm. uh, examine uh, identity. Uh, what do you think about that question? That's longer than a 15 minute episode. <laughs> um, we would really agree, and as a public library, we really strongly feel, you know, who is our community in St. Paul? We are St. Paul's library system, and what does that mean to really belong to this community? Um, one of the things that we have done at St. Paul Public Library that I think is um, one of the best examples of this is that as new uh, immigrant and refugee communities have settled here, um, some of our uh, communities uh, wanted children's books mm -hmm. to help teach and share their language, their home language, with their children, um, and they're just, not many existed. And so our library system, we have amazing staff who partnered with community members to create new literature and publish new literature in Amharic, Oromo, Hmong, Karen, put it into circulation in the library, but also just make it available for purchase, you know, by anyone. Mm -hmm. What does that do? What does it do to, mm -hmm to uh, highlight uh, this uh, diversity yeah. of understandings and experiences yeah. and culture. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. What does it do? Oh my gosh, it's so important. We I mean, Everybody gains, not just Everybody the, wins, yes. What a learning experience for everyone, mm -hmm. right? For children, for adults, for people who grew up in Minnesota like I did, for mm -hmm. people who are new. Um, one of the most powerful uh, examples of this, last year we, uh, launched a new children's book in the Amharic language. And I learned that the Amharic alphabet is a very unique uh, alphabet and that the alphabet um, is really an important part of the Amharic culture. And so one of the men who helped write this tell, book. Tell me, I'm curious, tell me about that now. You have, if you Google the Amharic alphabet, uh -huh. you'll see the symbols mm -hmm. are really beautiful and it really looks like no other language. Mm -hmm. And so not only um, it's, a, it's a written language, but just aesthetically, it's Amharic beautiful. For Ethiopia. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. yep. And so, one of the uh, men who had helped work on this project, he came to our launch event, and we have a big poster on the wall, and it has the cover of the book and the titles in Amharic. And he said, um, This means so much to me to walk into this library and to see my language on the wall. And I only see this um, when I go home to Ethiopia and now here in the library in St. Paul. Mm -hmm. And wow, that is such a big deal to me. I That's think amazing. It's so important too, and what why it is so easy to get behind supporting the library is for people to feel safe and seen and that they belong, they need to see themselves mm -hmm. reflected in their culture, reflected and respected in the space that they're in. Um, there's a lot of conversation about the library as one of the last places where we have true social infrastructure. I mean, where else are you within walking distance of a facility that is free and open to the public and says you are welcome here every single day and that really does mean everyone and so I, I am so appreciative of 
St. Paul's St. Paul Public Library's emphasis on making sure that all of the communities of St. Paul are reflected in, in the library and people can see themselves and feel that welcoming space. And there's always more work to do in that regard, but the investment in programs like, we have a cultural liaison program that the Friends are really proud to support, again, through corporate partnerships that are essential to how work gets done. Um, this means that native speaking members of communities are employed at the library to be the liaisons to new immigrant communities, to cultural communities that maybe are historically marginalized or underrepresented in all of our systems of government and in the city, and making sure that the library is designing programs that are for and about and informed by those communities and the individuals who are seeking something in the library. And St. Paul's doing just a great job, so I can brag about it since <laughs> we, get to, we get to be the cheerleaders for this work. But it's, it's really field-leading work mm -hmm. um, that's happening in St. Paul in that regard. It sounds to me it's like uh, it's about intentionality. Absolutely. Of uh, doing right because we intend to do right, mm -hmm. and we expect uh, to deliver and derive benefit from doing right. And doing right means doing right for everyone, for everybody, yes. Yes. because we recognize the, um, uh, um, what's the right word for it? The, uh, well, I'm, I'm at a loss for words, but the feeling is we recognize the commonness mm -hmm. of our experiences and how these experiences can be uh, revealed in different languages, different yes. approaches, different sets of words, et cetera. But I think that's a wonderful thing. What do you both see as uh, the future for the library? Uh, Beth, first of all, as a friend of the St. Paul Public Library, how do you see your role and your, the need to continue to support uh, relevance in libraries and in people getting what they need from libraries? What do you think? I think I'll, I'll answer for what I think our role is in relationship to the future of libraries. I think that we have a responsibility to help people understand that libraries, far from being antiquated or book repositories or nostalgic or romantic ideas of, of what a library is, that libraries are really at the edge, at the lead of a lot of what's happening in our community and that a library today is responsive to the needs of the community and is doing work that's really front of field and is responding to the, I need the library to be this for me. Um, and then our job becomes making sure people understand that and aren't stuck back in a different idea of what a library is. So I, I love to read. I am thrilled that there will always be books on the shelves of libraries, but I am also thrilled that the library has maker spaces and sewing machines and recording studios and 3D printers and vast numbers of computers and stories that are written in languages that are not my languages, but maybe your language. And that is, that's, that's the message we have to carry forward, that the library is moving with the community. Catherine, uh, same question mm -hmm. from uh, the point of view of the library itself. Yep. What's the future? Yep. Uh, what, and the future including what technology is going to do yeah. uh, to enhance or improve or change yep. uh, the, the yep. nature of the uh, service yep. the libraries yep. provide? Yep. Yeah, well, we are in an information and technology age for sure. And so an organization like the library that exists to help people understand and sift through information just becomes more and more relevant. And so how do we, uh, you know, technology uh, can be used for good and for bad. And the library is a place where we can help people understand a world like that where technology is everywhere. Uh, but I think also this idea of, and you kind of mentioned it, of belonging. And one thing about libraries that we really heard that people value um, is that it, we bring people together across similarities and differences to be together, to learn together, to grow together. And that need to learn, that will never end. And that's across our entire lifetime from the time we're born until we pass on. Um, and libraries are places to do that in community. I know for my own family uh, and my children, some of the best learning experiences that they have are in community at their library with their neighbors, uh, meeting new people. Um, there's nowhere else that we can get some of the experiences that we can get at our public library. Well, I haven't been to a library in a long time, but now I know what I have to do. <laughs> you know, to your yeah, I got to go. And maybe I'll take my grandson to the library yes, and hang out with him because I certainly enjoyed yes. my time and my formation 
uh, as a, a reader in the library. So you've just uh, reawakened that uh, knowledge and experience in me, and I thank you so much Great. for it. Thank you for what you do. Thank you so very much. Thanks uh, to you, Catherine Pinkert, yep. Library Director yep. for St. Paul Public Library. Thanks to you, Beth Burns, President of the Friends of the St. Paul Library. And thanks to Comcast of uh, Twin Cities for their support of your work and for uh, the uh, embrace and accessibility of technology for the residents of St. Paul and of Minnesota. Yep. Thank you yep. so much. Thank you. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Uh, pleased to be here and pleased to have you along as well. Today's program is uh, the first in a series. We're organizing to talk about civic, cultural, political uh, realities and opportunities in our community. Today, my guest is Corey Day. Corey Day, for eight years, has served as the executive director of the Minnesota Democratic Farmer Labor Party, the DFL. From fundraising to electing progressive leaders, the Minnesota DFL is noted as one of the strongest, uh, most well-funded, and best-managed Democratic parties in the nation. From holding back the red waves to making electoral history at both the state and national levels, Corey Day was at the center of building a state Democratic party that has become the Midwest's North Star. With a background in managing campaigns, in building coalitions, and in grassroots organizing, Corey Day played a key role in the success of Minnesota's DFL. He's bringing this incredible wealth of experience now to the market with his new company, Blue Ox Strategies. Corey's worked coast to coast, building strong relationships with influencers in progressive politics, with noted corporate leaders and decision makers at local, state, and national levels of government. From working with the mayor of Los Angeles to serving on multiple presidential campaigns, Corey Day has earned a reputation for his visionary leadership and ability to make resourceful decisions to reach ambitious goals. Uh, Corey's experiences include overseeing million dollar budgets, designing successful campaigns focused on grassroots uh, building lasting value relationships with activists, labor leaders, and elected officials, and inspiring the next generation of diverse leaders. Through Blue Ox Strategies, Corey Day will leverage his experience and work with clients as a partner in progress to make great things happen. Corey, good to see you. Thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me, Al. Good to see you again. Well, you know, you've been doing a lot of great things here in Minnesota. I have been impressed with you. I've told you this because uh, you've been in the game at a young age. You're a young man, and I think uh, in many ways uh, it's important that the DFL and political uh, realities focus on yeah. young energy. You bring that. You represent it. Tell me where you are in terms of uh, how you've decided to jump into the political process early on mm -hmm. and stay. Yeah, I was, when I was younger, um, coming up through school and college, uh, I had played sports and, you know, I, you know, when you're playing sports at that level, it takes a lot of time and energy. Um, and the one thing outside of that that I just had a passion for, um, and the biggest thing that I would say to folks um, when I was in college or even um, as I got into this business, the reason for it was it's relevant. What you do day to day actually affects people's lives. Um, the people that you work to get elected, the policies you fight for, they actually affect lives. And I wanted to do something that had a relevance to it and something that I knew that would actually help other folks out. So yeah, that, that's what drove me into working into this field. Now once you get in, you never know what, what road you're gonna be on mm -hmm. or what lane you're gonna be in. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely something that most folks I know and the folks I've worked for, um, you have to have a passion um, for helping other people. Let's go straight to the birth of Blue Ox Strategies. Mm -hmm. What's your vision there? We'll come back to your history and your yeah, background, yeah. the things that brought you here. But right now, you've in a, you're in a transitional spot, mm -hmm. and you're launching a new venture. 
what is Blue Ox Strategies? So what Blue Ox Strategies is, is it's going to be a public affairs company that focuses on campaigns and advocacy. Now, the big thing I thought about when I was working for the DFL and as I traveled around the country, you know, dealing with different vendors, different other firms, is that you just did not see people um, who were doing this work who looked or sound like me mm -hmm. or uh, folks from the communities that I'm from, the communities I've served. And I really think it's important that when we're having these conversations and we're fighting these different battles, that you have someone at the table who actually looks and sounds and represents a different voice. And I really wanted Blue Ox Strategies um, in this space, especially in Minnesota, where mm -hmm. you know you go to the Capitol and go to the, the halls of the legislature, you do not see many, well, actually you don't see any black lobbyists, mm -hmm. to be completely honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, you don't see folks who are working outside the Capitol who are doing the public affairs side of this. You don't see a lot of folks are people of color. And so I really just wanted to make sure that Blue Ox Strategies was going to occupy that space. And what we're going to do is make sure that we work to bring folks who look like us and sound like us into the fold. Why the name Blue Ox Strategies? A wonder, interesting name. <laughs> Tell me what the, what's the story on that name. So the one thing that, you know, and you had alluded to kind of the, the DFL party. Um, one thing that Minnesota has a reputation for mm -hmm. is that when it comes to working together in coalitions, participation, being involved, Folks know that Minnesota is it's the North Star, mm -hmm. as you said. It's, it's the gold standard. And I really wanted something that reflected Midwestern values. And I felt the Blue Ox is something that's very Midwestern. I think folks from, you know, folks from coast to coast, when you say Blue Ox, they, they, think, about, yeah, they, they, think, about, they, right. they think about Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And the blue, obviously, is that, you know, I've done most of my <laughs> work on, on the, the Democratic side of the aisle. And mm -hmm. um, I wanted folks to know it's a Democratic firm and that we are Midwestern. We have Midwestern values, and we're going to bring that to the fold. Why do you think there has been a dearth of presence of uh, black people, people of color, in the lobbying and public affairs space? What's the reason for it? You know, that's a great question, and I wish I had the answer. I think some of the reason is that we haven't, and this is me just you know, talking as Democrats um, and just folks who are you know, public affairs or political operatives, we haven't done a great job in building a pipeline or a bench of young people of color, millennials, and really, you know, we need to do a better job of supporting them, mentoring them, making sure that they understand that, hey, this is something you can do. This is a road that you can come on. And I think for a lot of folks, I think they go into other sectors too. You can go to nonprofit sector, and there's other places where you can do a lot of good. Mm -hmm. And I think some folks have looked at this, this, this lane as being kind of, you know, a little kind of cynical about it. And I think we as leaders, our elected officials, our party needs to do a better job of making sure we're supporting po uh, folks of color that when we do go to those halls that you actually see them lobbying, working for some of these corporate 500 companies, being public affairs folks, or, uh, government relations people, um, folks working inside the, inside of the government, working for the governor or the legislature. We need to see more people of color there also. I mean, if you see the PAGE program or you see folks who are working in the House and Senate, you just don't see a lot of folks who are of color except, mm -hmm. and I, you know, and I credit our folks, of, uh, people of color and our uh, Caucus, the new caucus that just got um, activated about the People of Color Caucus, that they're doing a great job in trying to energize and, and bring folks in, but we need to do a better job overall as a party and as political professionals. Mm -hmm. So how did you get the job as uh, the executive director of Minnesota's DFL party? Yeah, so I came to Minnesota around 2000 um, to work on a senatorial campaign. And one of the first people I've met professionally and worked with was uh, Ken Martin. Mm -hmm. And so Ken and I worked on and Ken numerous- Ken is the chair. Uh, yes, Ken Martin is the chair of the DFL party. We worked on numerous projects and campaigns through the years. And Ken got elected chair, um, once he got elected chair in 2009, 2010, uh, he asked me to come serve. And you know, I, obviously, I believe in his leadership, but I also believe that the Democratic Party needed it. Um, I think we were, it was a party that was somewhat in shambles, and I was more than ready to take on the challenge um, to help elect Democrats to bring the party back to where it used to be. What kind of success did you have? You know what? I, I'm, 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 I'm damn proud of what we did um, over the years at the DFL. We were able to make sure that you know, every statewide office is Democratic. Uh, we have the House of Representatives in a majority. We were able to flip numerous congressional seats. Um, more than proud of elections for Keith Ellison and Ilhan Omar. Um, we, year in, year out, and cycle after cycle, um, was the gold standard with state parties around the country. 
um, not just because we were successful in an electoral, you know, electing really good progressive Democrats, but it was the way we did it. We were a party that folks were partnering with, our progressive partners partnered with, our elected officials partnered with. They ran program through our party. Um, they allowed us to go out there and actually do the job that parties are supposed to do, which is talk to voters. Um, energize our base and it, it was just it was a great eight years and when I look back on it I look back with only pride you know uh, I'm presuming that you had experiences that are are um, uh, kind of reflective of things going right mm -hmm. and you must have experiences of everything going wrong oh yeah give me some stories you know I'm interested in something that comes to mind when you say you know what this is the way it's supposed to be and this sort of reveals uh, when things are proper in alignment, yes. what can happen, what benefit can flow from that. Anything come to mind? Yeah, I mean, I was, as I think, you can't help but think more recently with things, but, you know, I think about um, sitting in the war room this last cycle, and as we were watching the numbers come in, and we saw that, uh, that Keith Ellison wasn't going to win that race, mm -hmm. and knowing just the challenges um, that we went through. That was a nail biter. Yeah, but we were able to, but, but the great thing is with analytics is we, we knew kind of what, which counties were going to come in. We had a pretty good idea of the percentages that we were going to want to buy in certain places. Mm -hmm. So we were able to more or less call it a little earlier than the press were able to call that race. Mm -hmm. And it was just an amazing feeling knowing just, um, A, how extraordinary Keith is, um, mm -hmm. and then B, knowing all the folks around his campaign or all the folks, uh, different organizations, our, our labor partners who just put so much energy into to that race. I mean, that was, that was one of those races that was definitely an all-hands-on-deck team effort, mm -hmm. and it's something I'm just absolutely proud of. Then I think about the opposite, and I'll, you know, I'll never forget sitting in, I think it was the Marriott. Um, we're at the Marriott, I believe, for our um, election night party. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're looking at the numbers come in, um, you know, and it, people, Every poll we had, every indicator we had, Hillary Clinton was going to be the next president of the mm -hmm. United States. And I can't, I can't even describe sitting in that room and when that picture of, uh, you know, seeing Sam President Trump gives me you know, <laughs> bad feeling. Seeing that, that picture come up declaring him the winner, I, it, it, was, it was seriously the worst feeling I think I've, I've felt in you know, my 20-something years in doing this. Mm -hmm. And just the idea that we all thought we had it right mm -hmm. and just how wrong well, You had it right for Minnesota. Well, not, well. Didn't you? Well, it was, it was, I mean, you know, all honesty, our opponent, you know, had us winning by nine points or two mm -hmm. points in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. We won by barely a point. Okay. So everything was off. Okay. Um, and that was just one of those things. I mean, it was just such a lesson learned. And on that day, mm -hmm. the body of politics literally changed. The mm -hmm. entire world and when it comes to electoral politics and the fights that we're fighting changed. It was, it was you know, and to this day you're seeing that, that nothing is the same. Mm -hmm. And yeah. But the midterms. Yeah, the midterms were great. I mean, it was a great, I mean, it was a great rebuke of Trump's policies mm -hmm. and kind of where he bring in this country, the midterm. I mean, it was just awesome seeing those results. Um, we got to keep it up, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. Democrats can't get cocky mm -hmm. at this point. I mean, we got to realize this isn't about Russia. This isn't about going after Donald Trump. This isn't about impeachment. This is about health care. Mm -hmm. This is about staying on message and making sure that we're presenting the American people an uh, alternative, not just vote against this guy because he's running this country into the ground, but vote for us because mm -hmm. we're about A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. And so we have to just keep our eye on the ball, and I'm really hoping that all my friends who are at the parties around the country uh, working with these candidates and whatever we're blue access with candidates, we're going to make sure that we're presenting a, another picture of an, an alternative, an idea of how we can make things better, not just voting against something. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. My guest is Corey Day, former executive director of the Minnesota DFL, now the leader of a consulting firm, a lobbyist firm called Blue Ox Strategies. Corey, uh, you mentioned that the important thing going forward, moving towards 2020, is that the Democratic Party, in particular Democrats across the country, stay on message. You mentioned oh, yeah. health care. What are the other five principal messages that you think are going to drive uh, the sense of, of uh, equity, ownership, clarity yeah. uh, from within the people versus the temptation to uh, rail against Trump? Yeah, I mean, I think 
Obviously, I think healthcare is going to be the number one issue. I think economic issues are going to always drive. It doesn't matter what district you are in this country. People worry about what, you know, can they put food on their table and they're getting a paycheck every two weeks. So I believe that's going to absolutely drive national. I mean, I don't care if you're in West Virginia or you're in Southern California. Those are going to be extremely important issues. But I think the one thing we're seeing right now, um, and it's, it's just it's a new phenomenon, is <clears throat> the way the millennials, people of color, some of these social justice issues, these criminal reform issues, um, they're really in the, Dem in the Democratic Party, in the Democratic primary right now, those issues are going to rise up. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to see uh, these 20-something you know, presidential candidates have to talk about some issues that they haven't talked about in the past. That some of these issues, because if you look at our base of young people, millennials, people of color, black women, mm -hmm. um, they're going to have to address the issues that are affecting those different communities. Mm -hmm. And whoever does it the best, whoever does it the most authentic, is going to be the one that emerges out of that presidential, uh, presidential primary. And you'll see this around the country, that the folks who are able to really address, not just, I mean, you have to address those key those key, you know, a pot in a, a, a chicken in a pot issue, mm -hmm. but you're going to also have to talk about these issues that are truly affecting um, people's day-to-day -day lives. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland, concluding this part, this segment of our interview mm -hmm. with Corey Day. We'll come back in a few minutes with a, a follow-up uh, interview with Corey Day. Uh, Conversations with Al McFarland. Thank you for being part of this webcast, this broadcast. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. My guest is Corey Day. He's the principal at a new consulting firm. It's called Blue Ox Strategies. He's the former uh, executive director of the Minnesota DFL Party. We're continuing our conversation about uh, the future, the history of uh, politics in our community. One of the things that we're writing about you uh, in Insight News, Corey, is your um, statement that you want to broaden the pipeline. Mm -hmm. You want to open up a strategy that brings a, a number of uh, dynamic, young, mm -hmm. uh, sort of assertive, aggressive people to the party and to the political uh, arena. Uh, what's the vision? What do you intend to do uh, as a leader and with the organization Blue Ox Strategies? Well, it kind of brings me back. I remember in 2010, um, we had a, a, a PAC called Impact Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And I think about you know, what we did, we're educating voters, doing a lot of field work, um, a lot of advertising, just really trying to promote folks to get out and vote. Um, and I just think about the f people who came through that organization and what they're doing now. It's just there's some amazing folks who, that was their first engagement to uh, the, the political arena. I just want to figure out ways with Blue Ox to create those kind of opportunities again where you have an actual, you know, A, you bring it to the communities, uh, B, you, you open it up and you give people a real chance to come and participate and be involved. And I think right now is that when, you know, there are no open doors, right? And so my hope is that we create uh, an environment where the doors are open, where we get young, bright folks to work on these different issues, different, different uh, things that we're going to be working on. Uh, you know, different initiatives. Um, so the hope is just really to create the opportunity for them to have an open door and know that Blue Ox Strategy is going to be a place where their talent is welcomed. I think you've got some real challenges ahead, Bill. Mm -hmm. uh, Corey Day, among mm -hmm. them, uh, there is the sentiment, you've heard this in the community, where people, black people will say, we've been loyal to a fault mm -hmm. to the Democratic Party, not only in Minnesota, but nationally. Yeah. And the criticism that goes with that statement, that declaration, is that uh, there's a feeling the party has not reciprocated. The party has maintained yeah. a sort of cultural uh, paternalism. Mm. Uh, the idea that uh, even in the progressive arena, yeah. white is right and black step back. Hmm. How do you combat that? Do you hear that? Or am yeah, I no, no, it? no, that is. And if you hear that, yeah. how, do you, how do you address that so that people know that, uh, that even though there are uh, kind of cultural barriers or barriers of understanding, or barriers of privilege hmm, right. uh, that there still is room for and really a mandate 
for change and inclusion. How do you address that? Yeah, no, that's, I, I wish I had just uh, an answer to, to I don't have the total answer for that, but I do know the things, the things that I was seeing uh, before I left the party was these great groups were springing up. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the one thing that I've been very impressed and proud of is that these different organizations, these different groups are, are coming up outside of the party and they're breaking the wall down. They're not waiting for someone to invite them in anymore. They're just kicking the wall down. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of attitude you gotta have. You can't wait for it, you just gotta just take it. And that's one of the things you, you see with uh, the way Congress changed with all these wonderful women who got elected. They didn't wait around. They, they kicked the door in and they're not taking any BS. I mean, there's things that we care about, there's issues, there's uh, priorities that we have. And what I, I think you're seeing more than ever with especially some of these young folks who are getting elected, they're not, they're not gonna take a back seat anymore. It's time for us to make change. And I think the one thing that I'm, that I'm like it emboldens me is watching these millennials and these young folks who are not waiting around anymore. They are taking the bull. They are starting their own organizations. They are running for different uh, seats within the party now. Um, that is, that's, the, that's how you make change. You don't wait for it and hope that someone's gonna hand it to you. You gotta go take it. You don't ask for permission. No, no, no. And, I, and they are not asking for permission anymore, I tell you. I mean, it's a, just wonderful when you see some of these folks who are getting elected and the, the young campaign teams around them who are helping lift them up. I can recall, uh, you know, in the movement of Minnesota DFL, I remember when uh, I think it was um, before Representative Jefferson was elected, uh, there was a transition. Mm -hmm. Jefferson was 56, or my neighborhood in North Minneapolis, the district numbers have changed. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, after him, uh, there was a question of who would succeed him. And there was a, a genuine discussion about whose right uh, it was to be there because yeah. of time in, in the party or time in the community. That conversation is changing a little bit now. Uh, are people saying just because you've been around 20 years doesn't mean you're guaranteed a seat? Oh, yeah. Is that what we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, that you're, I mean, one of the things, I mean, I, I imagine what you're going to see um, a lot of our long standing um, incumbents get challenged. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it goes back to the sense of saying, hey, since, since, because you've been here for 10 years doesn't mean this is your permanent seat. Mm -hmm. If I have better ideas, if I think that I have better policies, I'm going to go after it. And I think you're, you're going to see that a lot more um, in the future, not just here in Minnesota, you're going to see that all over the country where uh, incumbents aren't going to feel as safe um, in their seats because from the right or the left, you're going to see folks who feel like they have, you know, it's not some kind of God right to hold on to that seat, but if I feel like I have better ideas and I can run a better organization, I'm going to go after it. Is there a downside to that? Do you end up creating more uh, fracturedness uh, yeah. and therefore make yourself or your party uh, less effective, less able to marshal mm -hmm. the numbers you need to guarantee a win? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's always an up and down side to it. I mean. You know, I'm not a believer per se, just because you've been there long means you're a bad legislator or you're not doing a good job. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I also believe that you know, some of these folks have sat in the back of the bus for too long. And you know, if they want to take their shot at it, if they want to go after it, if they want to take it, then go take it. No, it's, not a, it's not a birthright to any of these legislative seats or seats around, any of these, none of these are birthrights. So yeah, as a, a person who works for the party, um, where you know inner party fights, where primary is tough at times, yeah, absolutely. Um, but one thing that we never did, not once did someone come in my office and say, "Hey, Corey, I want to run for this seat," and I said to them, "You shouldn't do it." Or no, I mean, my job was to say, "Okay, well, this is what you would need to do, and this is what it would take." I mean, I've had folks walk into the the office and say, I want to run for president. Mm -hmm. And I got to say, okay, well, this is, this is how this is what it takes to become the president of the United States. So it, it's one of those deals that it, it cuts both ways. Um, but it's one of those also, it's none of our rights to tell someone not to do it. So let's do politics 101. Let's talk to mm -hmm. the millennials and young people that mm -hmm. uh, are thinking about it. Let's talk to those who uh, feel like uh, really there's uh, no reason uh, to be involved because the cards, the decks are stacked against us already. Let's talk to those who are older, 
who feel like they've been either marginalized or disenfranchised mm -hmm. in the past and because of that negative experience right. they've become cynical how do you uh, engage them what is politics 101 going to tell them to reignite the passion mm -hmm. or to support the passion that they're bringing the curiosity they have about how to uh, become uh, able to change uh, the community to change the world and ultimately to change uh, the self the person himself or herself i mean it's very basic on this front and you know i think it can go both ways and people believe in this or not but those who show up and the one of the things that you know i've always thought was amazing about our process here in minnesota is that those who show up try to run for a little, run for a party office or come to meetings and, and you know participate mm -hmm. that's the first step I mean you have to you have to want to be there you have to I mean you it, it's easy to be outside of the house throwing rocks right mm -hmm. you have to actually go inside and say how am I going to change it from within and I admit there's challenges to that it's not always easy I know that it, there's a lot of entrenched powers involved in that but the best way to change it is just to get involved and then make your, your lane through that, that avenue. Um, and it's not just with the party. I mean, there's so many different resistance groups and other progressive groups that you can get involved with. But just sitting at home and, and complaining about it or you know, screaming from the mountaintops, that's not going to change anything. Just getting, I mean, I, I always like to use uh, looking at Representative Omar. Her organization, they didn't, they didn't sit around and wait. They ran for local offices. They ran, became chairs of the, of the local units. I mean, they are intertwined into the DFL now. Mm -hmm. And there was a time when that, their, the first strategy for a lot of folks was just to sit here and say, you guys, all, you guys are all awful and you, you don't really care about these progressive values. But then at a certain point, I think folks were like, well, I, I only can scream so loud. Mm -hmm. I, I need to just get involved and change it myself. Mm -hmm. And so the thing I would say, politics 101, you got you, you to gotta show up to make any changes. So get involved. Go to your local community meeting. Go to your local DFL meeting. Go to your local, you know, uh, whatever organization, whatever resistance group it could be that's a meeting in, in your district or in your community. Those who show up are the, those who change things. So I would say to anyone at, from old young, and, I've, and it, it's amazing to me because I've just seen, so, I mean, so many people that would just blow your mind that were just, you know, a few years ago, just coming into the door. Um, and all of a sudden, I remember uh, Mayor Fry. I remember I met Mayor Fry when he first came to Minnesota. Um, and, you know, he was an attorney. He wasn't involved in politics. He was, I mean, he was just a, a guy who moved to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And the one who, thing he who knew? who knew, the one thing he was very clear about, and I mean, he, he talked to us about was, you know, I, I want to be involved. I think I can make a, I, you know, I love this community. I, I love this state. I really want to get engaged in this. Next thing you know, the guy's mayor. I mean, these things are, are extremely feasible. I look at uh, Mayor Carter's the same way. He's always been civically engaged. But I remember when we first worked together, uh, I think it was uh, 2003 or four. Um, he was just getting out of college, and just and his question was, "What do I have to do to, to make a change? How can I help my community?" And same way, Melvin just he started showing up. He started going to those meetings, getting to know his community, getting to know his local activists. Uh, it's just it's one of those things that. I know it sounds very simplistic, but really, it's those who change the world are those who show up. The pushback on that, uh, Corey Day, is that uh, I've heard in an experience where we go to the meeting, mm -hmm. and the sense you get is that uh, the deck is stacked, mm. that it's the meeting before the meeting, <laughs> and yeah. the meeting after the meeting, yeah. uh, where the deals get cut, and that uh, black person walks into meeting A, and all of a sudden, people are literally or figuratively whistling Dixie, yeah. uh, everybody's happy, good old days, and then nothing gets done in the course of the business or the order of the day, and leaving you to leave at adjournment uh, and to have the sense that the yeah. business is going to happen. Starts when you leave. Now yeah. that you're leaving, that's cynical. Uh, uh, but how do we, but no, I think your, your point is show up and stay there, right? Yeah, I mean, it's true. I'm not, I, I, you know, I would be a liar if I said that you know, I haven't heard that, that story throughout the entire state. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are different, you know, units that, and the different, you know, party units that are better than others and are more inclusive than others. Mm -hmm. But I think just all in all, as a whole, um, you know, people are so resistant to different and new. Mm -hmm. 
And I, every organization I've been involved in is no, is no different. The DFL is no different. And I'm, I'm not going to sit here and make excuses and say I haven't heard that, that story before because it's true. I, I, sometimes it is not the most welcoming environment. It, they make, you know, it, it should not create obstacles for people to be engaged and involved. And realistically, it does sometimes. And we've got to get better at that. And one of the ways we get better, as I said, is you show up and you, you become that leader who makes it welcoming for new people to walk into those doors. But I, I'm not going to sit. I'm not going to sit here and, and blow smoke. I admit there are definitely some challenges that uh, that <coughs> I experienced over my years there, and I still experience to this day. Corey, what's your personal history again? You, so, you know, where are you from? Yeah. So no, I, your mama. Who's yeah. <laughs> so I, I grew up in a suburb of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, my mother was a nurse. Uh, my father worked at a hotel for 25 years. Um, very blue collar folks who good Democrats. Um, so yeah, I grew up in that kind of environment. My mom's from Tennessee, my dad's from Mississippi. So imagine the kind of values that they put forth on me, hard work, you know, um, you know, those who succeed are those who actually get out there and, and bust their butt to try to get things done. Sisters and brothers? Yeah, I got, I got two brothers and a sister. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a youngest of four. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my brother, oh gosh, my brother's a, uh, just retired 30-year Marine um, and a Trump voter. So, oh, really? <laughs> oh yeah, he yeah. tries to explain to me why Trump's uh, uh, better on military and all these other issues. And mm -hmm. you know, it's it's hard to see one of my own blood do mm -hmm. that, but uh, you know. <laughs> that's the way it works. Yeah, that's it's that's. Not, that's I uh, it that way. That, that's, How about that's, the other yeah. members of your family? Uh, yeah, they're all you know they're all good. They're all Democrats. Uh, um, you know, they're all you know, like they watch MSNBC all day and. and Want to talk about it all night these days, you know. I, it's, I think my dad's obsessed with uh, Donald Trump. He just, you know, he can't stop watching, you know, the clown car uh, night in and night out. Um, so yeah, so I grew up with, uh, you know, grew up in the, the suburbs of uh, Chicago. Then, uh, like I said, I went to school at Illinois State and uh, played uh, played ball there for my years there. And then after I graduated, um, I like to say I just went on the road show and. And this is for folks who want to get involved. Who want like, how do you like, how does this you get into this field? I literally, I went where the work was. So you know, if it was in San Francisco, there was a campaign. I packed my bag and went to San Francisco. It was New Jersey or Florida. Uh, heck, in 2008, I was in Alaska. So for uh, for Barack Obama. So I, I think the best way is just, especially when you're young, um, is just to, to go where the work is. Um, shut up. Work hard. You know, it, it's those, I will tell you right now, um, those who work hard, that gets you further <laughs> than you'll ever imagine. Um, I know that when I've hired people or I've done work on campaigns, it's that hard, the hardworking guy you see that you know is going to succeed in this, who's going to be making it to that next level. We're out of time. Oh. Thank you. This is wonderful, man. <laughs> you know, I just, I, it's so easy to talk to you all, all the yeah. time. I, I appreciate you having me here, and I just, I, I love what you do for the community and um, the stories you tell and make sure that, you know, you hold everyone accountable. So we really appreciate your thank work. Thank you so much. These conversations are important, and we thank you for the work, of leadership, uh, the vision that you're sharing as well. Thank I'm you. Al McFarland, Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. Support for Conversations with Al McFarlane was provided by Old National Bank Comcast Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance and North American Banking Company